Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this online webinar and to discover why machine learning for physicists is a good fit for you. I would like uh, now to present our speakers for today. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so we will have Dmitry Livanov, who is rector of MIPT. Welcome, Dmitry. Then we will have Stanislav Protasov, who is MIPT alumni, technology president and co-founder of Octronis. Welcome, Stas. Then Kostya Novoselov here, MIPT alumnus, Nobel Prize winner, chairman of the ST Strategic Advisory Board, professor of physics, Center for Advanced Materials and National University of Singapore. Welcome, Konstantin. Then we will have Ilya Shimchik, who is a Tony's ICT Autonomous Team Principal, and Andrew Stujanin, MIPT alumni, and as well AI MI expert consultant at Schaffhausen Institute of Technology. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I would like now to invite Mitri Livano, Rector of MIPT, who will join us here on the stage. Mitri, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, all of you. Uh, today we launch the innovative education program, which is devoted to the application of machine learning in uh, research in physics. And I think we all agree that such uh, technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning affect strongly the uh, everyday life of millions or maybe even billions of uh, people uh, around the world, but also uh, it has a very strong applications in the field of modern research, particularly in physics. And that's why uh, this program is uh, uh, of great importance for us, for uh, FISTECH or MIPT. Uh, I um, want to uh, uh, welcome Professor Kostya Novosolov, who will give us uh, the uh, short talk about the application of uh, machine learning in uh, physical research, and I think it will be very, very significant uh, talk. And uh, it's also my pleasure uh, to stress that um, we uh, uh, worked on this program with uh, cooperation uh, with SIT which is the young university in Switzerland, uh, but uh, has a great ambition to be uh, the uh, world known university. And uh, for us, it's also very important that it was established by uh, MIPT uh, graduates. And we hope that this uh, program is uh, just the first uh, our uh, joint uh, project, but not the last, and uh, our cooperation will strengthen uh, as uh, uh, SIT activity uh, will grow. So uh, thank you very much for um, being uh, today here, and uh, let's uh, start, start our activity. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite all of you as well just to uh, ask any questions. You have Q&A feature here, so please feel free to ask anything that um, our speakers today can answer. But as well, we will have live Q&A um, in the end of the event and the webinars, so please feel free just to drop out these questions. Now I would like, uh, love to as well um, uh, invite Stanislav Protasov, as I said, the MAPT alumni and technology president and co-founder of Aptronis. Uh, Stanislav, welcome to the event. Thank you for taking time to join us here. And uh, please, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Bayana. Thank you all for joining. Let me start sharing my slides. I don't know how successful I'm going to be. Hopefully you can see my slides. We can see your slides. Okay, uh, I will talk a little bit about what is SIT and uh, what this uh, machine learning for physics uh, about, why we are actually doing it together with uh, Andre and MAPT and uh, Konstantin Novoselov. So, um, for essentially, a lot of the problem which uh, current world has can be solved by better knowledge, better uh, computers, and better uh, software. Uh, I will run really fast because uh, I have only 10 minutes. Um, there is um, a very interesting idea that the universe is uh, a computer, 
and as such software somehow represents the laws of nature. And um, for all the recent development uh, in machine learning, in how we understand the intelligence, how we uh, solve uh, uh, complex uh, problem, including the uh, for problem, for example, of finding the cure from the COVID and things like that. Uh, it shows that uh, machine intelligence and machine learning can be really useful in uh, fast advancing in understanding the world. And uh, current computers mostly are classical Turing machines. I mean, uh, it's probably uh, for several decades old the idea of Turing architecture, but it uh, still dominates uh, uh, for our current digital world and it's getting better and better. And uh, uh, going to the limit of uh, physics, I would say in a sense that uh, uh, can we have uh, uh, two nanometers uh, technology for our chips and our computers. Yes, we can, but can we go lower than that? Uh, very unlikely. And basically in order to move forward, we need uh, new materials, uh, we need uh, new hardware, and this is where advanced materials uh, come in play. And this is uh, how quantum physics come in play. And for that uh, computers, we would need uh, to have uh, completely new software. And um, uh, for, for we would need new software to design those computers, to emulate those computers, uh, to run on top of those computers and new applications, which are, uh, get all the benefits of those computers. And this is uh, why uh, pretty much everyone uh, in science, in computer science, in physics, and in business need to understand the basic principles of machine learning and uh, for computer science. So that's how uh, Schaffhausen Institute of Technology idea came. And uh, SIT is uh, founded by Sergey Belousov, who is also MIPT graduate. And uh, for, he involved uh, basically uh, some of his partners, including me, in setting it up. And uh, the idea is to build a really good research university, uh, make it one of the best in the world. and. Um, at the same time to have a good educational program where student can learn through, uh, through collaboration with researchers and uh, uh, for working on uh, applied uh, problems and applied issues. So uh, at first SIT will be focused on uh, computer science, particularly uh, cyber security, this is what we do in Acronis, uh, software engineering, uh, and uh, also uh, machine intelligence. Uh, in physics, uh, the focus will be in quantum technologies and advanced materials. And in business, it's a different application of computer science to business sciences and uh, everyday life. And another to fuel this university. Uh, basically, SIT ecosystem will consist of uh, both non-profit and uh, for-profit uh, part. So the university itself is definitely non-profit and it requires money uh, to run. And for that, we will have uh, seed capital and seed start garden in order to uh, bring to the life new startups and uh, for making nice exits out of it. Uh, SIT business services is mostly business consulting. 
SIT autonomous rollers Alimira is actually software ventures which are being established and which are dealing with uh, uh, machine learning in that way or another. SIT autonomous is actually a platform which can be used for a number of applications, for example, AI in sports, uh, which uh, of Acronis uh, of, uh, has a good track record in collaboration with different uh, sport teams uh, in soccer, Formula One, and so on and so forth. SIT roles will focus on uh, machine intellig uh, intelligence in, uh, in conjunction with uh, advanced materials and uh, things like uh, drug discovery. SIT Alimira is actually a learning uh, man management system. And SIT Academy is uh, training uh, for a uh, variety of experts, like corporate training, like uh, uh, for learning in the universities, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, why we actually um, doing all that? because uh, for the last 20 years, we established a number of companies reaching uh, hundreds of millions in revenue. And we basically faced the fact that uh, you need a lot of technological leaders in uh, software companies. Uh, here are listed some chief uh, for, for positions in such companies. Basically, 20 years ago, uh, it was pretty much one position, uh, chief technical officer. But the problem is that um, all those roles which you can combine in a one guy, uh, they have uh, contradicting uh, requirements. And basically many companies start establishing more and more uh, chief uh, something officer uh, position. For example, uh, I know the guy who is chief cloud infrastructure, uh, infrastructure officer. And uh, this continues to happen because even the small project right now, if you talk, for example, no code, low code uh, projects, they are not really low code or no code. They just, uh, they just base themselves on a tons of open source and other uh, software. And as such, they include pretty much any reasonable project right now includes millions lines of code. And when the complexity grows, you need uh, uh, several guys to handle the development of the software because uh, keeping all the roles in one guy is uh, quite uh, difficult. It's uh, like in this uh, movie, split, uh, which showed quite nicely how several identities, uh, how several uh, people can live inside one human head. Uh, in, in the movie, if I remember correctly, there were like 24 guys uh, living in one. Uh, and this is what happens uh, when you basically try to combine several roles in one. So what we want to do in SIT, we want to help people to become quite technical, uh, understand uh, uh, the domain, but at the same time, grow uh, both uh, management and leadership sk uh, skills, because you could not have uh, vision management skills and technical skills uh, in one guy. It's very rare combination. But you should understand basically the difference between three in order to uh, successfully mitigate the lack of some skills uh, in yourself. Not every manager could be a great leader. Not every leader is actually a good manager. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the great leaders, they are quite lousy managers. And uh, the best leaders, they do understand uh, that they need a good manager to achieve their vision. And uh, I would suggest all of you to read very short book by Lee Coca. 
who is a great leader and who understands leadership pretty much by instincts. So uh, that's why we built uh, the program for where we try to give a very good blend of technical skills, management skills, and leadership uh, to our students. And uh, that program is being developed and uh, improves uh, continuously. This is why it's a very good idea for you to look at SIT and maybe to apply for a master program at SIT. And just to remind you, uh, right now, uh, there is a shift in paradigm. There are new materials, new hardware, quantum physics, advanced materials, and new computer software uh, for stack, which are being developed. And this is quite interesting. And for all that, you need to understand basic of machine learning. And this is uh, why we built this course, served by Alimira, by the way. We do everything by our own means, which is created uh, by Andrei Ustujanin, who is going to talk later today. And uh, I invite all of you to go through this course because uh, this is the first time we are running it. It's going to be free of charge this year, but uh, I think next year we will be already charging for it. With that, I will leave this scene and uh, let Konstantin to talk about advanced materials. Thank you. Thank you, Stanislav, a lot. Uh, so as you already announced, I would like to invite uh, Konstantin Novoselov, uh, MAPT alumni and Nobel Prize winner, uh, who will uh, join us here and talk about functional intelligent materials. So uh, Kosti, the floor is yours. <laughs> you are muted, Kostya, so just... Until you unmute yourself, please, I would like to invite all attendees um, and our guests as well to like uh, send questions to our Q&A feature. You have it on Zoom, so please feel free to, to do it. Great. Okay. Can you hear me yeah. now? Can you hear yes, me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Right. Uh, thank, thank you so much for, for being here today. And uh, I'd, I'd like to witness what Dmitri and, and uh, Stas already, already said, that um, the twist and turns in science really take very, um, very unusual turns. And, and uh, indeed, I would never thought that uh, I, will, I will be ever relying on artificial intelligence in my, in my work, I would, I would always uh, say that my own intelligence should be enough, but in fact, we are more and more switching towards this this very interesting and, and rich topic. And even though we don't really fully understand how to use it, uh, and um, I'm sure that there is still a lot of opportunities there for us. So we we are progressing quite rapidly on the on the on, uh, on this way so uh, we do have a number of projects around uh, the applications of artificial intelligence for for the creation of advanced materials I won't go through through them today they're reasonably technical but I will rather show you examples of say the recent breakthroughs in condensed metaphysics in in, in material science which will definitely require the applications of, uh, of uh, uh, the artificial intelligence to, to solve those, those problems. And um, I won't talk about graphene today much, but let me just start, start, start with it and say, okay, we will probably all know what is graphene, the thing is possible material, and it has a number of very interesting, sometimes unique properties, definitely unique in the in its combination of uh, of of what it can offer and because of this combination it has been 
already applied for a number of applications and these days you can there are lots of pro, uh, products around us where uh, where we do use graphene uh, all the time starting from energy to uh, optical electronics and sensors to uh, to composite materials but um, and there are many ways how we can produce this material so we, we do have ways how to grow it in in large scale even though originally when we started uh, with, with it we, we used the uh, very simple scotch tape method and frankly speaking we still use it up to now but then uh, and of course when we use it we, we, we take we take a piece of graphite which we split with uh, with uh, with the scotch tape graphite is the material which you find in your lead pencils so the, the question was if you get graphene from your lead pencil can you get other materials from your colored pencils and indeed that's uh, that's very much true so by exfoliating other materials we now we've got uh, a range of uh, of of other 2d crystals which um which uh, we can isolate and 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 study and these days the family of the 2d materials is really huge ranging from very metallic and even superconducting like nylon the selenite and graphene to semiconducting to 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 isolating there are 2d magnets and so on and all of them can be can be studied and demonstrate very interesting unusual physics but the the the, the next breakthrough which occurred in this in this area was the formation of the artificial materials because if you got access to individual layers of those 2D crystals, you can probably try to create um, an artificial stack out of those of those two, two, two D crystals. We call them one the Waals heterostructures. And indeed, such such materials can be created. They actually they show very non-trivial properties. We created a number of uh, unusual devices based on such uh, on such materials and you can imagine each device only takes a few really countable number of uh, of layers so they're very thin flexible transparent and we can make transistors we can make leds we can make solar cells out of out of those so that's uh, uh, it's quite it's extremely active area of, of research these days and those heterostructures can be extremely uh, extremely complex so here is an example of an led based on such on such technologies and because we have a huge number of those 2d crystals we can actually cover a range of of very different properties for example if we are talking about leds we can cover by using different materials we can cover a quite a large range of spectrum and for example molybdenum ditellarite it sits right at the silicon uh, at the silicon uh, gap and and uh, it, it means that it can be used for uh, for telecommunications including quantum uh, telecommunications when we learn how to produce reliably the quantum dots in such uh, inside of such material so it is so it does offer it does offer a lot of opportunities and actually oh, there are other ways how to how to create artificial materials quantum materials but this of this uh, technology one device technology uh got one particular knob uh the turning knob which which we which we can which we can use uh which doesn't which, which cannot be used in any other technology we can control not only the sequence of materials not only how many different layers do we put but also we can rotate those materials uh, with respect to each other and um, surprisingly I will uh, if you rotate those those crystals with, with respect to, to each other you can change the electronic properties uh, electronic properties dramatically so uh, so just even a very simple, device like you, you, you take two layers of uh, of graphene slightly rotate them uh, with respect to each other and you get a very new uh, new 
device which shows so-called negative differential uh, resistance it means that unlike if you have the normal ohm's law you apply voltage to something the current always should 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 grow in this case you apply voltage the current actually reach the, the the maximum and then goes down and such devices are really highly thought after for any high frequency electronics like in your in your mobile phones and and so on so um so there are other uh, other examples where the this the this this twist control uh, is is really important. So here is the example of uh, of the combination of of graphene and and boron nitride. And when we put one on top of each other, so because there's there, so the, these two two materials are very similar, but not entirely similar. Their uh, unit um, uh, unit cells are, are slightly different. They form the so-called Moira pattern, and then the Electron scattering in this in this uh, more a pattern uh, creates a very interesting, very beautiful effects. And again, we can control this this more pattern simply by by rotating the two crystals uh, with respect to each other. And um, the electron scattering in this more pattern creates a very interesting effect, which was. Uh, high, again, highly thought after, predicted long time ago, but but, but never observed in um, in experiment is the so-called the Hofstadter butterfly. If you apply a magnetic field, if it sits right uh, in uh, inside of one plaquette, one periodicity, this magnetic field doesn't play any role anymore. It just cancels each other, uh, so you can consider new new quasi particles, electrons plus the flux quanta and so it's 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 really a beautiful a beautiful quantum quantum effect so but what i'm what i'm trying to say that our our devices is is becoming more and more complex uh with with every next experiment so i showed you we, we can use a combination of two materials like graphene and boron nitride we can put the third layer and we can slightly uh, slightly rotated and then we get even more uh even more uh complex um uh more pattern so we are we're we're getting more and more uh difficult structures more and more complex structures and more and more complex um uh, complex devices and unfortunately the limit where uh, where our um our theory works we're just coming to an end. We're, we, we're coming to the limit of what we can predict. So, so here is the example of the experimental picture. It is the STM uh, on this uh, this twisted, double twisted graphene. So the, you can see that there is a very unusual periodicity, very un, uh, unusual structure, and this this structure involves. Uh, thousands of atoms, and unfortunately, we are not capable to to calculate such large structures with, even with the most powerful com computers. So we have to search for new ways, new ideas. How can we predict uh, the properties of such of such structures? And the properties of such structures become really, really. Uh, unusual. For example, two years ago, well, three years ago now, there there was a huge breakthrough when superconductivity was observed in such twisted um, twisted uh, uh, heterostructures. We do uh, get some insight because of because of some uh, preliminary calculations. But in fact, if you want to uh, to to determine the really what is going on in, in such in such devices we cannot rely on our traditional methods we really have to search for um uh, for for new ideas how how do we get into uh into into the properties of, of such materials and so i said superconductivity is one example um slightly different structure we can get ferromagnetism and again, it's absolutely impossible to use 
our traditional methods to to predict the, the the properties of such structures so we have to rely on artificial intelligence uh, in this case but now what we uh, so when we and um, fortunately or unfortunately the structures uh, such complex structures were uh, do demonstrate very interesting behavior and sometimes they demonstrate um, uh, out of equilibrium behavior as well and this uh, such such behavior uh, comes from the fact that those individual components in such structures interact strongly but also they interact through multiple different interactions like uh, like uh, elastic forces like coulomb forces like one the valves and this leads to the creation of um, highly degenerate systems and uh, it's similar to uh, to the uh, to the energy landscape which we find in uh, in in proteins and as probably many of you know it is uh, our uh, even our best com computers are completely powerless in uh, when trying to calculate the structure of a protein but this this problem uh, at least the, the problem of finding the lowest ground state of the problem for it was solved recently with the use of the uh, of the um, uh, of the artificial intelligence and that's exactly what we uh, are trying to to do right now we're saying that let's create um let, let's go beyond the current scientific paradigm and create materials out of equilibrium so basically materials which are similar to living systems. And unfortunately, we don't have ways how to describe them within the uh, existing uh, within the, the existing paradigm, but we can try to uh, try to use novel methods uh, like the artificial intelligence and to create the dynamic, the dissipative nature of those of those materials. The traditional approaches like DFT, like molecular dynamics, they don't like the, the, the dissipative system. So they don't like the, the dynamic system. We we'll, we'll only can predict the static properties of materials. But that's not, not, not of any interest for us anymore. We want to create new materials which are capable of producing some functions, which are essentially out of, out of equilibrium. And, uh, I cannot see any other ways here at the moment, apart of using the AI and uh, uh, AI capabilities beyond the, the, the current approaches, dynamic AI uh, to solve the to solve the properties of uh, of such devices. So I think I will. Uh, I spoke already too much. I will probably uh, stop here. I won't. I won't go into the. Uh, details of the of the uh, of the current out of equilibrium materials which we've got in the lab, but uh, I, I can I just want to repeat uh, again here that um, that the future of materials is to understand the out of equilibrium phenomena, and one of the most powerful way how to how can we do it is to uh, is to use the artificial intelligence and dynamic artificial intelligence thank you so much thank you Kosti, a lot so now i would like again just to invite you to please ask questions we had already a few of them we'll be answer to uh, maybe three four questions later during our live q and a uh, so now anatoly if we can move to another slide i would like to present uh, andrew sujanin uh, who is um, part of mipt as well ai mix consultant at sat and the director of the laboratory of methods so uh, andre please uh, uh, take uh, the stage and uh, let us know more about these course yeah, machine learning courses yeah thank you very much Bayana. Uh, <clears throat> So I would like to uh, briefly give an overview of the course that uh, we have been working on and are currently working on uh, for, for MIPT students. Uh, and before, I would like to just uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, so I have background in computer science. I finished uh, MIPT in 2000. 
since then, I've been working in, in different places that somehow are uh, related to the physics and uh, to machine intelligence. And uh, currently I'm a uh, consultant and at uh, SIT, uh, I'm uh, associate professor at MIPT and head of lab of uh, big data analysis at uh, Higher School of Economics University. And uh, we, we are quite, my group is quite tightly connected uh, with projects related to physics, uh, in particular you know, particle physics at CERN. Uh, we are members of a uh, couple of experiments. Uh, we're collaborating uh, with uh, Kostin Vasilov on the projects that he has mentioned uh, just before. Uh, so we, we uh, try to combine methods and tools that somehow are relevant uh, to solving problems in, in physics domain. Of course, it is a quite broad uh, area and the ambition is quite high. So it will be just a sample of the methods, uh, but hopefully uh, judging by your uh, feedback, we can make this course better with each iteration. Uh, as as uh, uh, people uh, see the development of the science, it uh, goes with uh, several paradigms and changes dramatically with every new paradigm shift. Uh, here is the map suggested by Jim Gray uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so he uh, sees the development uh, that, that goes from empirical science through theoretical approaches that uh, explain everything in, uh, the, in the language of laws of nature, differentiable equations, uh, calculus, etc., uh, to the computational paradigm that uses computers, supercomputers, uh, to uh, model even more complex systems. Uh, and the final or the most current way uh, to, to move science is application of the data-driven approaches that rely on machine learning quite heavily. Uh, so the data in that sense is the next language that joins together theory, simulation, and empirical observations into, into something that you can uh, extract knowledge and build upon further and further. Now, this slide gives uh, some examples of recent development that shows that the uh, mixture of uh, physics and machine learning actually goes in both directions. So it is not like uh, developing of methods, fundamental methods that one can apply to a variety of problems. Instead, uh, even uh, th there are examples that borrow some notions and some intuition from physics and develop fundamental methods instead like simulated annealing or stochastic Langevin uh, gradient descent and uh, gauge equivariant convolutional networks or Hamilton equivariant flows come from physics. That's why uh, we think that uh, development and, and, and teaching machine learning to physics motivated students is, is, is really fruitful because you guys can uh, bring your intuition from physics to uh, this field of machine intelligence and uh, develop new methods that can be applicable in much broader context. So uh, here is the very uh, rough uh, course metadata that we had in mind uh, while developing this course. Uh, so the goal is to uh, develop theoretical knowledge and practical skills and basic machine learning. So we start with really uh, basic ideas. Uh, then we want to cover tools that most likely you will be using in your practice. And uh, we, we want to go even further uh, to give your understanding how research process with the help of data-driven tools can be conducted. Uh, so, uh, this how this course is going to be structured. Uh, it is split into four parts. Uh, so the first is the basics of machine learning and deep uh, learning. So we start with some 
in intuitive concepts and uh, ju just show how uh, very basic approaches like gradient optimization and uh, simplistic uh, connectivity con con connected architectures uh, can solve quite difficult problem uh, that are capable of uh, competing with human uh, interpretation, the human uh, level of object recognition. Um, so we, we start with this and, and on the right you see the, the basic classification of the algorithms that we're going to touch in uh, the first part, well maybe except for the reinforcement learning because this one uh, deserves uh, special attention that uh, we do not plan to include here, but mostly we will be focusing on supervised and unsupervised algorithms. Right, the second uh, course part is uh, devoted to the supervised learning algorithms uh, that dwell in the in the field of computer vision, time series, and graph structures. So uh, we, we uh, look into the deeper tricks uh, and, and uh, deeper uh, approaches that allow to improve uh, the, the uh, uh, already quite advanced neural networks even further uh, and, and look how one can apply those techniques to a variety of physics uh, problems. Uh, most examples uh, will come from our own experience, but it will be not, not limited. Uh, so for, for time series, uh, for example, we will be looking at some climate data sources, climate data that show uh, how uh, multi-series analysis approaches can be applied to this kind of uh, data. Uh, the, sec the third course part will be uh, focused around uh, generative models all basically it is about unsupervised learning but um, you probably heard about a variety of applications that people have developed that allow enriching images and uh, those are based on uh, generative models that can sample from the uh, large dimensional hidden space object that looks realistic enough even uh, one can allow to transfer images from one domain to another like create uh, well-known fake, deep fake videos uh, or objects that do not exist. Uh, it was a nice exercise uh, to get you familiar with. So you understand that uh, neural networks can imagine things that never exist that will allow you to take those methods with a grain of salt. So if you apply it to physics, uh, you will understand limitations of those methods much better. Uh, so there are many different uh, use cases that we look at, uh, including at style transfer or including um, change tr transfiguration of uh, one species to another species. Uh, speaking of physics application, we'll, uh, in, in the context of generative models, we'll look at the fast simulation uh, which is one of the key applications that allow to generate realistic output of physics devices. Here you see uh, one of the building blocks of LHCB detector. Uh, so and, and it takes quite a lot of computational power to realistically simulate the uh, output of those devices. So you can you can see here uh, one of those. Uh, that has some physics behind of it. And uh, it's not like a simple generation of an uh, apple from the orange, uh, but the same technique can be applied for fast simulation of the output, which works thousand times faster than a regular Monte Carlo simulation. Or uh, uh, machine learning methods and tools can be applied to optimization of complex, uh, complex uh, structures. Uh, so the, the fourth part of the course is going to be devoted to uh, understanding of advanced learning methods that uh, related to optimization, uh, neural ordinary differentiable equations uh, that, that allow to, to learn the dynamics of the complex system without 
without uh, explicit writing the equations uh, from the top of your head. So um, speaking of the course format, uh, it is uh, quite uh, experimental, I would say. Uh, there is no like uh, set of lectures, so it, 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 it will not be similar to the course that, that MIPT currently runs. So we have all the lectures published online in, in the form that you can uh, watch and read, uh, but without videos. So everything will be written in text uh, with some interactive demonstration. So the text will be accompanied with, with some uh, plugins that you can uh, allow you to visualize uh, complex convolutional neural networks and uh, some clustering algorithms, whatever you're going to study. And the seminars that uh, essentially a Jupyter notebook, uh, notebooks with tasks that you have to fulfill. Um, and and uh, there will be some interactive sessions like once per month. And the next one or the first one is going to be uh, on the 22nd of September, 5 p.m. Moscow time. Uh, and uh, where we're going to answer your questions and answer and, and uh, some concerns, comments. Uh, so try to connect here if you're going to uh, select this course as a mandatory one. Because uh, we, we uh, plan to run this course as a two streams. So the first one is going to be man mandatory. Uh, so if you uh, plan to get the task in the, uh, the, sorry, the mark, the grading in the end, uh, you, you, you have to do the um, uh, task and I will talk about grading a little bit uh, later. And there is an optional stream that uh, doesn't put any obligation. So you will be free to, browse lectures and, and do the seminars, but uh, we will not give any marks afterwards. So for mandatory stream, uh, we, we plan to do uh, the following grade, apply the following grading scheme. Uh, so at every uh, part of the course, uh, there are uh, several topics and each topic consists of several sections. And every section, is uh, essentially evaluated by quizzes that uh, you would have to answer, like a very simple multi, multiple choice uh, questions. Uh, practical notebooks, uh, which you have to perform yourself, that those will be peer graded. So it means that uh, you will be uh, given a deadline by which you have to submit the notebook. Uh, with the solution, with your solutions. And after this, uh, those uh, notebooks will be distributed among you, among the people who have to get the marks. And um, essentially, uh, your marks will be given to your, your colleagues. Uh, the grading accuracy will be taken into account. So giving random marks or, or giving top marks without looking at what you get for the grading will not work. And there will be some anti-plagiarism coefficient. Um, so this is basically the uh, evaluation scheme, how we want it to run. And in conclusion, I uh, would like just to add to what I say said uh, before that uh, there will be uh, a chat, a Telegram chat that I will help you to get through this. Uh, so please consider adding yourself if you want to get uh, notifications about some events uh, during this course. So uh, this is it. Uh, hopefully uh, you will like the materials that we have prepared um, because in, in um, many ways it is a unique exercise. So we would like to hear your feedback afterwards. And during q and I will be able to answer uh, your questions regarding uh, what I've shown you just before. Thank you very much.
Thank you a lot, Andre. Uh, so yes, as you mentioned, we will soon have a live Q and A, but please as well feel free to drop out questions. We already had a few, so we answered them. Um, and uh, yes, feel free to as well reach out to Andre later. So right now, I would like to introduce Ilya Shimchik, who is a Cronus SCT Autonomous Team Principal, and who will tell us more about SCT Autonomous Racing and technology for racing. Ilya, please welcome. Yeah, thank you, Bayana. Welcome, everyone. I would like to highlight how we use artificial intelligence, machine learning technique in our company, in our racing part. So first of all, what we are doing, so we are a racing team, but we are not like usual racing team. We don't have driver. We don't have a racer in our car. Actually, our driver is a software. So we're developing software who drive racing car autonomously on the racing track. So we have, we have full-size racing track that you see in the bottom of the slide. And we have real track. We are competing in uh, tracks in Las Vegas, in the United Kingdom, and all, all over the world. We have different tracks where we are competing. Also, we have some simulator or like a simulator environment to compete. But let me step back and like, uh, why do we need such competitions? Because like it's competition is like sport teams competing and winning like prizes. But actually, it's not only for like uh, winning the prize. It's also for pushing technology forward. And actually, if it come back and like uh, think about from what started this self-driving technology started. It started from competition. It started from DARPA Grand Challenge, where the car was driven in the desert autonomously by different universities. They were competing uh, how to navigate the car through the desert in autonomous mode. And after this, uh, we realized that it's possible to build self-driving car and actually many self-driving companies started from this competition and the participant in this DARPA Grand Challenge started own companies who start, uh, who, who developed in the cell driving technology. And another like answer to why we need such competition as Rob Race, uh, the championship of cell driving racing, because championship push the technology forward. For example, Formula One provides innovation for automotive se sector like over the decades. It's a driver of main innovation for, for the cars. And as well, the Rob Race, the, the championship we are very we are participating in, is a facilitator of self-driving research and development. It also boosts safety system for the cars in, on public road because only in Rob Race, in such like extreme condition, we can test our software in extreme condition in racing track safely and then transfer this knowledge from racing track to the real world and also it's world relevant competition and it's involve and attract different talents from any like areas to uh, to provide their knowledge and uh, improve their knowledge in this technology and then train uh, their algorithms and ai professionals as well so please next slide uh, so, uh, as I said, Rob Race is a first uh, competition uh, in cell drying, is a well-known competition. I mean, comparing with like a, some small series of cell drying. And uh, our goals in Rob Race, of course, as a sport team is to win the competition, but also is to push forward the technology and develop safety systems that can help uh, work uh, and operate car more safely on the road. And, it's a simple example. Uh, let me provide. So just imagine if your car will be driven uh, not as an average driver, but as a professional race driver. And in case of some emergency or like accident, you'll steer your car not as a just a driver, but as a race driver. You will avoid much more accident and we can reduce the number of accidents on the road if the car will be driven by professional drivers. And we think that. Um, in road race and in such competition, we can develop such professional driver we can act, which can act in extreme condition more safer and accurate than a usual driver and than usual technologies that developed for public roads. And next slide. Yeah, coming back to our topic. So why we need the artificial machine learning and machine intelligence uh, for our cars? Uh, our car has a lot of sensors. So here's a sample configuration. Actually, we can edit this configuration and test different setups of sensor on our, our car. So here we have like different lighters, cameras, radars. Also we have ultrasound sensors. Also we have a very precise GPS antennas and V2X sensor on also additional sensors such as like speed sensors on the wheel and also some optical sensors um, as like as optical mouse has. And 
all those sensors provide a lot of data and this data need to be processed and organized and some information need to be retrieved from this uh, data, raw data and that's where the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms need to be used and where we apply this and that's for object detection for classification for reconstruction of like 3d scene based on our our data and also for fusion data and from different sensors and yeah so please let's go to the next slide yeah and cases where we are applying uh, machine learning so it's not only for perception so basically we can uh, split uh, uh, our system on two on, on three main uh, models uh, one model is perception next model is control system and third model is uh, a high level decision making and uh, and planning so and in each of these section we can use machine learning approach to work with data to make the decision so regarding the perception it's quite clear that we can uh, 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 work with uh, uh, understand the surrounding based on machine learning approaches, but also for control part as well, we can substitute the complexity of car dynamics uh, and substitute this complexity with neural network and control this as a car based on the pure like physical models of the car, but based on the neural network. And for high level decision making as well, we can use machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. Um, yeah, and just to give you a feeling of what's, what's robberies, what's the spirit of robberies and competition where we are uh, competing uh, and the difference, because it's quite different domain that was presented before. It's not research. It's not like pure scientific and research. It's more uh, application of machine learning in the industry and how we apply and what spirit we have. I would like to show you the next slide and video, what's the current stage of robberies and what's the uh, championship look like please next slide what does the future look like i have an idea but i can tell you exactly what it sounds like is it going to work we're about to find out we're not trying to out cool anyone we're trying to out nerd everyone Metaverse is a mixed reality racing format where you can play with data and give the right to place objects to our audience. So it's not just another motorsport thing, it's Motorsport 2.0. This is either going to be a glint into the future or a spectacular failure. Either way, you're going to want to watch. Yeah, thank you. So that's actually the last slide from my part. So I'm welcome also to answer any questions. So, um, Bayana. Thank you a lot, uh, Ilya. So we have uh, a question for Andre. Uh, can I attend a class integrated stream as optional and get the mark in the end? Andre, are you with us? Okay, let's go to the next one. So we have uh, actually a person who raised their hand. So uh, Stephen Ovino, please, uh, you can ask your question. Uh, hello, once more. Can you get me? Yes, we can hear you. Feel okay, free to great. ask questions. Uh, great, I'm Stephen Ovino, a student from Egypt, Egypt Japan University of Science and Technology. I have a question. Uh, previously, I attended this lecture and uh, the recording was in uh, Russia. I'm requesting if the next time we, uh, for guys who are able to speak English alone, so that they are able to attend and uh, get lectures in English. Thank you. Even can you jump in maybe and uh, because Andre, it seems like it's uh, it's not with us right now. Right, um, um, Andre, um, can you jump in? 
So um, thanks a lot for the previous question. And uh, of course, the course will be in English and they will be happy to, um, to offer next uh, webinars in English also. Yeah. So Thank if you, you want to take this class, please write to me. It's ii at sit.org. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Okay, Stas, are you maybe with us here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we have a question for you. What makes the future scientific and technological leader? And what are the courses that we need to include in modern university uh, to increase the probability that the person becomes such leader? Uh, that's a very good question. Basically, uh, one of the problem of uh, MAPT and many similar universities education is that they don't teach you any uh, social or psychology courses. And uh, But the problem is whatever we do, science, business, uh, software, uh, for, we interact with people. I mean, uh, pretty much everything we do uh, somehow makes sense only to other humans. I mean, okay, we can invent co quantum computer, but if all humans die, who is going to use it? And uh, does it has a standalone value? Uh, not so clear, right? And as such, uh, the courses which increase your emotional uh, EQ and uh, your social skills, or what is called right now uh, soft skills, uh, has ex very unique value, especially for the guys who are coming from uh, technology or science uh, part of the life. And I think uh, this is what is important just to uh, get in touch with uh, psychology, sociology, and similar sciences in order to start understanding humans and in order to start understanding what they say. One of the problem of human language, and that was researched uh, quite deeply by various group, is that when we communicate, uh, people actually quite often uh, mean different things, even using the same words. And uh, it's also a skill to understand what uh, the other party trying to tell you uh, and uh, uh, being able to predict uh, behavior and actions of the other uh, party. And I think this is very important in order to become a leader uh, for, to start understanding people. Thank you a lot, Stas. Okay, uh, Andre, maybe did you join with us? Yes, okay. So we have one question for you. Uh, can I still get Mark in my diploma if I follow non-compulsory stream? I don't get it pretty clear. Um, no, we do not uh, plan to give marks for those who for follow optional stream. Uh, well, what, what do you mean on, on compulsory? So does it, is it mandatory or is it optional? So Kirill, do... Kirill, you can join us by voice if you would like to clarify this. Well, anyway, so mandatory gets the marks because uh, all people in the stream will be involved in the peer grading. The other stream will not get any marks because we okay. cannot rely on, on people who uh, do not, do not uh, follow the, the deadline scheme and it, it, it doesn't work. Thank you. And uh, we have, uh, I think one more question. Uh, so we had it actually uh, live, but I don't think so that Actually, Stephen, uh, Stephen, do you want to again ask your question to Andre? 
Okay. No, no, no. Uh, then we are anyhow like uh, running uh, out of time. So I would like to thank uh, all of you to uh, that you joined us and that you took time to uh, participate in this webinar. Uh, so uh, just a quick announcement that uh, you will all get uh, follow up uh, with uh, this recording. So you will be able to check out everything. As Ivan already mentioned, please, if you have any questions, you can write to uh, his address, I, I. Uh, at sat.org and uh, you can find out on this uh, web address more about the machine learning for physicist course. Uh, thank you uh, all of you speakers who joined us today and uh, thank you attendees and we see you on the different webinars. Thank you.